Okay, so this video is meant to uh, be a review for the uh, what would be our material on week three, which would be the first uh, major Photoshop day. So going over some basic tools and um, generally uh, just getting a head start on a couple of things. So we go to File and then New in Photoshop. And you can see I've got a couple of uh, different recent things that I've worked on, but then there are different types of presets up here. Okay. Um, and these different presets allow for um, different sort of automatic settings depending on the situation you're working in. For example, with photography, we have uh, 4x6 and 5x7, 8x10, these are standard photographic sizes. They print at 300 pixels per inch, which is the bare minimum necessary to make something look nice printed. They're always in landscape mode. Um, there's print, which would work in 8.5x11, which is letter size, or 11x17, tabloid. The, again, these are different presets. Um, the web would have different web sized presets but it would work in pixels instead of inches and would have 72 dpi and then film and video would have your HDTV or DVC Pro settings things like that um, but there are other things that happen when you use these other presets uh, things that change with the layers and with guide markers and things like that so we're gonna stick with photo presets even if we change these things over here and we will um, because we want it to look the same way <laughs> that it does in class, right? So I'm going to choose 7x5, which is a 5x7 thing, just landscape. I'm going to set for um, my unit of measurement, though, pixels. We really need to get used to, in this class, measuring in pixels because we don't print, really. Um, there are a few things, maybe at some point, where I'll say it has to be this width in the end because of inches, but most of what we do is, is going to be in pixels. Um, which it translates the numbers automatically here. And then the other thing is that for background contents, we need it to be transparent. So we don't want to have that white background that we draw onto and have to get rid of. We want to just say right from the beginning, transparent background. You may have to scroll with your scroll wheel to get to transparent. We saw that in class. So I'm going to say create and it creates a document. One layer, it's not locked and it's transparent. All right. Now then, uh, basic drawing tools. We have a little bit of the ways down, and if you hover over it, you should see a description that says the brush tool. It looks like a paintbrush. And I believe the default settings are somewhere around here. Um, the size isn't too big, and the hardness is put down to zero. And as you paint with it, right, you'll see you get this, if I zoom in a little bit to a bigger brush, this very airbrush look. All right, and you'll see I got my properties up here. And if I click this one right here, that's how I'm changing the size. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see that the numbers change very slowly down here and then suddenly they jump to hundreds and thousands of points. If I bring it up here, it'll be, where did that? There we go, 2000, then it jumps to here. All right, so we can change the size of the brush here. You will also see me changing the size of the brush without me doing anything. Those are the two caret buttons um, or two bracket buttons next to the letter P. So the one, the left bracket will make the brush smaller and the right bracket will make the brush bigger. I do this to save time on the videos. All right, the other thing we can change is the hardness, which if I bring this all the way up, that, mu that looks much different, right? So what's happening is instead of going from fully opaque in the middle of the line to fully transparent across the entire line, right? It's it's being fully opaque, whoops, um, pretty much across the whole line. We'll get into more details of that later, um, but suffice it to say that you get a harder edge when you bring up that hardness factor. The other thing we can change easily right off the bat is the color down here. Now we spoke uh, the opening class a little bit about color, but you have a hue bar on the the right hand side here, hue meaning the color of the color. Uh, is it blue, is it green, is it orange, is it red? Um, so we can change that there. And then we have the lightness and darkness, which goes from top to bottom. So pixels are turned on 100% at the top, pixels are turned off 100% at the bottom. And then we also have um, 
saturation. So highly saturated colors are on the right. Zero saturation to the point of grayscale is on the left. All right, so you choose your color that way, and we say OK, and then now I have a different color. The other thing we can change is the opacity. So as long as you have your brush tool up, you will see your brush properties, and the opacity is right here. Opacity is a fancy way of saying transparency, but it's the inverse. So if something is 0% opaque, then it is 100% um, transparent and vice versa. So if I put that to 50%, <coughs> you can see that we have this um, where the transparency is, right? You can see it's partially covered by that blue, um, but we can still see the the image through it a little bit, as opposed to here where we can't see that, that transparency pattern at all. So no checkerboard means this is fully opaque. This is partially opaque, so it's, it's graded out a little bit. And if I, if I hit it again, you can see it a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, right? Um, each time I add it, it's adding, it's not 50 plus 50 equals 100, it's 50% more out of what's left in terms of transparency. That's how that works in terms of math. So you can barely see it, but there is something there. Um, back where I had the brush only once, you can also see the red underneath. And so you can see one brush stroke through the other, at least partially, right? Um, I will say this works better, right? This particular brush being a half opaque does tend to look nicer if you have the hardness turned all the way down. Now that really looks like an airbrush, right? There you go. Um, so you can combine these things to get different types of looks and different types of brushes. Now, I just noticed, because I tend to use these hotkeys <clears throat> without paying attention, I've done two navigational things without explaining what they are. Control plus zooms in, control minus zooms out, and the space bar toggles the hand tool. Technically these are tools over here. I don't want you using those tools because that is that slows you down. It's more tools to learn. You should really get used to your hotkeys. So control plus to zoom in and then if you hold the space bar it toggles that pan key. So we can kind of pan around our document and then control minus will zoom you back out. And then again we pan to kind of see where we're going. You can know how whoop, Zoomed in you are, bottom left corner, um, it says right now 66.67%. So this is two thirds the size of this document. If I zoom in once more, that's 100% the document size. So, which is obviously bigger than my screen, which is not helpful for trying to see what we're doing. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so that is our general navigation that I have been using accidentally. Okay, the other types of tools I want to show you. Um, oh, one last thing. There is an eraser tool. It erases the pixels. All right. Um, it is also like a brush, so you can make the brush smaller. You can make the brush semi-opaque, so it half erases. Um, and you can make it fuzzier edged too. So I can, well, that's still pretty harsh. Stand by. When it comes to erasing, this number has to be much lower in order to achieve the same soft look. So you can see over here that this looks like very, very airbrushy, but if I want the eraser to feel like an airbrush, oh, it's still a harsh look. Oh, I'm on the wrong type. That's why. There we go. I want those soft edges. We'll get into what the pencil is a little bit later, um, but suffice it to say, when it comes to the eraser, I tend not to use the harder edges. Okay. Now, by the way, Control Alt Z will step backwards um, so that you can go basically undo multiple steps. This is the only program where you have to hit the Alt. Um, you can also go up to Edit Step Backwards or Edit Step Forwards to add the things back in. Okay. Um, the top few tools, we're only going to get into a couple today, but the top several tools are all um, selection tools. 
There are ways of selecting various things from your toolbar, which by the way may look slightly different in order than mine because there are a lot of different ways this can be organized. Currently I am under the workspace for photography, but if you are under essentials or graphics and web, depending on what the school defaults to, your toolbar may look slightly different. But the tools are the same, so this is always the move tool. This is always the brush tool, so you just look for that icon. All right, the move tool, you already saw me use it accidentally a couple times. It moves things. Um, because these are all on one layer, they're all together. And separating them out will take work. That'll actually be the next class. Um, but for right now, just know that there's no easy way to separate these things out with these selection tools. Um, because they're all on top of each other and they're all on the same layer, which is over here. We can see a preview of it. It's just, it's like painting on canvas. You can't take back what you already put down. Um, there is this marquee select tool, which allows us to make a selection of sorts. Now I click and I drag to do that, and then I can move the box around. But you see this little dotted line? That's the selection, and that's the part that's getting moved around, the idea of what's selected. But I'm not moving this stuff. If I wanted to move this stuff inside, I have to go back to the move tool, and then I can do this. And you can see why things are so hard to separate out, right? It left this clean line. It was kind of maybe hard to notice because this was all very subtle, but there's gradations going all the way from where I was airbrushing stuff to here. You can actually see it's a little discolored there. Um, and you can also see that the selection is now following the paintbrush line, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's kind of telling you exactly what's been selected. And that will continue to be the thing that's selected until I deselect it. Now, another thing to know about selections. If I bring up my brush, and I'm going to put a different color on it so that we can like really see the difference. Put the opacity all the way up. Turn this up. There we go. You see that? Only the section that's got a selection on it can be affected. I can try and paint out here all day, nothing will happen, but if I come in like this, it will. And it's actually only partially selected here because this area has been partially filled in, which is why it's kind of stopping at this edge and then kind of half coming in over here. So the selection follows what already exists there. So I cannot make this space in between any, it took, takes, takes a very long time. I'm click, 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 like a hundred times and now it's made it darker because it's only adding in 10% at a time each time. And there we go. Okay, so if I have something selected and I'm done working and I want to deselect it, the best way to do that is go to select, deselect. You could try and use this to the marquee tool to select something else, but then you just have something different selected and working with it will be very difficult. Once we say deselect, now we can paint wherever we want. All right, let me see what next. There are other selection tools. We're going to go over them next week, but those are the two you want to know now. Next up, when it comes to layers, remember that this eyeball turns on the visibility of it. There's an opacity thing right here that lets us kind of turn down the opacity. It doesn't do it live. Um, well, it might do it live. I'm recording the screen. You can see it doesn't change as I drag it until after a while and like needs time to catch up, probably because I'm recording my screen. If we want a new layer, so this layers panel, whenever you're in any panel, libraries has the thing here, Instagram has the thing here, whatever panel you're in, there's a menu and it looks like a few little lines. And you click those little lines and you can get the menu and in our case the top selection is new layer. It asks you what you want the layer to be. And we're just going to call it layer two for now. We put it there. And now I can paint, right? But that one line of paint is separate from the others. This is the only part that's separate, right? Um, all the rest of this stuff is stuck in one layer. It's all smashed together but you can use layers to separate out your material. So you can use layers to keep things organized, make it easier to keep things separate. If you have different ideas that you might want to edit later, you use separate layers for that. 
Okay. Now, in order to do some of the next stuff, we need to have an image. We need a photographic image of some sort. So I already have some that are downloaded. They came from like Flickr and such. So um, they're in my downloads folder. And the best way to open pre-existing images in Photoshop is to go File, Open, and then navigate to where your downloads folder is which usually there's shortcuts here. So you can see I have a few more shortcuts than you guys do at the school. There's a desktop. This is my actual downloads folder. You might have a documents folder or you might have a flash drive. Um, so I just need to find my image, which is all the way down here. And I know I can see a preview of it. Nope. One five, there it is. Um, I should do a better job of naming these things. I can see a preview of it here and I click open and so now I can work on this image. This is a JPEG image. So this is a JPEG that I downloaded from Flickr. Um, it is copyright free um, or Creative Commons licensed anyways and um, so now I can paint with this if I want. Now I could just click the little lock to unlock the layer and start trying to, you know, like paint and outline around it. But if I do that, these things are together. I can't change the color of that very easily. It's it's kind of a mess. So I'm going to go up to my little layers menu, click that and say new layer. And this time I'm actually going to name it, you know, drawing, let's say. And then that way with my brush tool, I can start to paint or color, whatever, right? And it'll be separate. So this is one of the reasons we work on separate layers. The reason we have an image out here though, is because I wanna show you um, a couple of different things that are going on here, how these tools work and how the system works. And I needed something detailed like, whoops, like this to do it. So we're gonna hit control plus and we're gonna zoom in as far as we can go. Now, before the image looked all nice and smooth and pretty, but when you start zooming in, you're gonna start to see this breakdown um, where it kind of looks pixelated, like a bad DVD. Um, and if I keep going, 1600 I believe is the limit. Oh, my computer can go further than the school computers, cool. Um, once you get down as close as you can, you're going to see this grid. So instead of the nice inside of a flower, we've got these weird squares and some are green and some are orange and some are purple and some are black and what's going on here? Well, this is, uh, Photoshop is based off of what's called raster images. I usually call them bitmaps. Those two words are interchangeable. I call them bitmaps because that's kind of the old word for it. Um, and it is a map of bits. You can see it's this grid kind of looks like a Mar an old Mario level, right? Mar those That resolution on those games was so low that everything had to be all squared off. You would see like anything he was jumping over would have been like stepped, like you would have seen the details. Um, and there would have been limited colors. So there's a lot more colors here. There's probably more visual information in this tiny portion I'm looking at than there is in the whole of Super Mario Brothers. Um, and what's happening is that the way raster images are stored is on this grid. There's no smooth lines. There's nothing like such like that exists. It's all a grid. Everywhere you look, it's a grid. So the flowers that we think have curved petals, it's just this, step down, step down, step down, step down. And it's just that when you zoom out, it just looks like a smooth line, right? That's, that's what we're dealing with is that grid of images. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you um, with this image. The second thing I wanted to show you is how these brushes are going to interact um, with what's going on. So we have, I'm gonna bring up my brush tool and I'm going to turn the hardness up all the way. Whoop. Make that a little bit bigger. And I'm just gonna draw, you know, like an arc Sorry, I'm gonna put that more in the middle. 
And then I'm going to turn the harness down all the way. Put that next to that one. And then underneath your brush tool, if you click and hold, you'll actually see there's a pencil tool. I'm going to put that right next to the, br the hard brush. So it's pencil and then the hardest brush and then the softest brush. Um, and I'm going to grab my move tool so we can look. And I want to kind of compare these things for you guys. So you can see here the when you turn the hardness all the way down for the brush tool, um, you get something that's a certain thickness um, and it's opaque for a certain amount of time, but then it spends a very long time going from I can't see through it to I can completely see through it. And you can see like the details in the flower start to disappear until there's just the brush stroke and then they start to appear again. Um, and if we look here, we can see that this is like a solid line. There's really not that gradation, except it's actually not that simple. So part of dealing with raster images is that it's hard to tell where one thing ends and the other begins. So on this airbrushed looking one, it's like, where is it no longer green, right? If we're zoomed out, we kind of think we know and we can kind of tell. But if you were really asked to separate in minute detail, that green line from the red background, where would you stop? It's it's very, very tricky to know where that is. This is why compositing can look bad in films. It's why it's very expensive. It's why it's very hard. It's why your green screen should be shot well. Um, because film is just a raster image like this that they then, you know, bring it to the computer and try to take apart. But I should point out that your brush tool is not as sharp as you think it is. So here we can see there's actually like four steps of anti-aliasing on it, or aliasing, excuse me. So this is the solid green color, and then that's the background. And then there's mostly green, tiny bit of red, somewhat green, a little bit of red, and then like it switches over to being a bit more red and less green, and then mostly red and a tiny bit of green, and it gradates like that. And you can see it does that everywhere. So it's not as sharp a line as you think. Even if you turn the hardness up all the way on a brush, it's never going to be that sharp a line. It just feels like it is. The pencil, on the other hand, you can see right away what a difference that is, right? See those jaggedy edges? That, by the way, is why the eraser was giving me a hard time before. So I had the eraser set to, instead of brush, pencil and look at that you can see can't I change there we go there you go so the pencil for the brush looks like that however I'm sorry the pencil for the eraser um, it's a brush style and a pencil style this is the brush style whoop we should probably turn the hardness all the way up there we go see how there's still a gradation so the eraser is a good thing to look at if you're if you're really looking for how the pencil and, and uh, brush differ from each other. And I just realized I accidentally drew all my pen, pen her brush lines and pencil lines on the background layer. So that's awesome. Uh, so we're going to undo that, um, and we're going to grab our brush again. And we're going to be on the correct layer because you want to make sure you're on the layer that you're trying to draw on, which in my case is the top layer. And I am drawing with a mouse, so this is going to look terrible. But I just wanted to put a few lines out here um, so we could have something to look at. Because the other thing to keep in mind with these layers is that you only affect the layer that you're on. So, for example, if you have an eraser and I erase the top layer oh, with something that's actually turned up all the way. There we go. Right? You get that bottom layer is unaffected because I'm not on that layer. So it's kind of like working with selections only you're selecting by sort of whole paper sized sections of this that overlap with transparency. If I select that bottom layer, the one with the photo on it, right, it gets rid of the photo, leaves the drawing. So whatever you're trying to do is going to be on the layer that you're working on and that's all there is to it. There are exceptions to that rule 
one of them is text or type excuse me I'm gonna say text a lot technically what I mean is type if I'm asking you to add words to something for an assignment this is the type tool in every program possibly that exists this is what it looks like it's a T and it's that specific typeface or font and um, when you click it you get your options up here I'm going to I'll leave the green green looks nice and I'm gonna turn the uh, size up a little bit because I'm, I'm always typing things that are too small but it doesn't matter which layer I'm on wherever I click it's going to create a new layer right a type layer so type is a specific thing that needs to have its own layer just to, to keep it live live meaning I could change it at any time I can double click the T here um, uh, and I can change the words I can change uh, the typeface so I can double click it it all ends up selected and instead of whatever this is I can change it to any one of these things and you can see the samples of the text there I can also change the color if I need to line it up a little bit um, don't this box just means it's selected if you click off like grab the new tool there you go um, so when we're working with type it always makes its own layer I can add to this or I can add a new type layer but it's, it's always gonna make its new layer I'm changing the color of this just so we can see something more obvious there we go um, the other thing is that these layers stack in a particular fashion so right now the type is over the poinsettias but the drawing is over the type because that's how it is in here it that this is the order if I want the type on top I have to click it and I have to drag it upward and now the type is on top of the drawing we can reorder this at any time if I drag the type down to the bottom we don't see it at all because it's behind this layer this is where these little eyeballs come in handy you can turn layers on and off and see where things are see how they're interacting all right um, so we're gonna be using type again next time um, but you want to get used to the idea that if you want to change it you gotta double click on this T make sure the whole thing is selected before you change the color or change the um, size of the typeface here maybe 180 the presets are for much much smaller documents you will not be using 16 point type in all likelihood if you're using an image that's big enough for the assignment alright um, let me see what else we want to do okay last bit I said before that this image was a JPEG it was it even says blah 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 dot JPG um, it's also telling me with this asterisk that it has not been saved so if I go to file save it'll just save it right gonna ask me what are you trying to do because JPEGs at these these images here that Windows can read easily and show me a preview of um, that you can open up in preview this is a project from the one class there's some jumping collages right um, these are all JPEGs right so they're a flattened image they can come right off of the phone they someone can take a picture or they can be composited and so that's all we need to worry about there but we have layers now right we have all of these layers that we we need to store somehow and so when you go to save this in Photoshop Photoshop is like ah you can't use a JPEG and what it's trying to tell you is if you try to save it as a JPEG you're gonna lose your ability to work on this if I want the ability let me cancel this for a second if I want the ability to make any of these changes I need to have access to these layers I need to be able to turn things off on move them etc if you flatten it you lose that so when you go to save it it says would you like a PSD a Photoshop document and you say why well, yes I would and so I can I'm not sure if that's how you spell poinsettia but um, 
I can change the name of it and now it's a PSD file and what that means is that it has changed file types. These are the two main file types you will use with Photoshop. PSD which is a Photoshop document that is your working file. All of the things you do in my class when you are working you should save them like this because otherwise you're going to get something flattened and you can't change anything. I'll show you what I mean. If you go to file, save as, and you say oh instead of Photoshop document I want a JPEG. Um, because reasons. Uh, maybe because that's what I started in. I think that's important. So I'm going to say JPEG. And I'm going to say save. And by the way, when you save a JPEG, it always asks you about the options and the quality. And you just you can bring it up to the max. We're not doing anything big enough that that matters. Say OK. And then when I go to... You can still see that my PSD is what's open, not the JPEG. And if I go looking... For that JPEG, you'll see it previews here. The Photoshop document doesn't. Windows doesn't know what to do with the Photoshop document. For the JPEG, it does. I hit OK. See how it's locked? It's only one layer. And it's all stuck together. All right. JPEGs are great for sending to a client because of this, because the client can't make a few changes and then use it without your permission or without paying you. Um, it's a good way to also send it to a client because they don't have Photoshop on their computers and so you need to be able to show them what you're doing in a manner that they can see it. You could also, on a new different layer, put in a watermark to prevent theft of your work without being paid. Um, a lot of people that do this kind of work, they'll say preview across the side. Um, but this document, the PSD, dot PSD, that is your document that you're working on. That is the thing you are working with. Um, closing my scribbles because I don't need them. And you can see I can have two different documents open at the same time. So you should be careful which thing you're working on. I mean, here it's obvious. I have no layers. So I obviously don't want to be working on that one. No. Um, but just be aware that you want to be working with PSDs as long as possible. Um, until you are exporting for some reason, which is essentially what a JPEG is. So those are the basics of Photoshop. We're going to get into more image manipulation later, um, and there will be other videos that go over the specifics of the homework.